greetings from Cape Town. I'm, I'm currently in quarantine in Cape Town. Um, so uh, just sharing my screen. Um, so just as a, a quick background um, to myself. So I'm, I'm not a computer engineer. Um, I started my career in a, as a medical doctor, as a physician. Um, and so I tend to take kind of a biological view um, of these technologies and of the systems that um, we're working on. And ICSO is really built on a vision of creating a digital immune system for humanity, um, utilizing these new Web3 tools and enabling us to program resources. And today we're going to talk about capital specifically so that in the way that an immune system does, we can sense and respond to sustainability threats or to um, the kinds of problems that humanity faces uh, and do that with purpose. And so um, really kind of the experience that uh, led into this work was uh, started more than 20 years back um, when I, I was very involved in the response to the global HIV AIDS pandemic, which required large scale um, uh, social change and agent behavior change um, right down at the sort of decentralized level. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of that background, uh, which I think is important to bring us into this technological innovation that we're working on. Um, but I'm going to talk today about the use case, which is uh, education focused. Um, so focused on the Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is um, inclusive and equitable ed education. Uh, quality education. And uh, so we've been fortunate to do this work in the context of a development impact bond in India. <clears throat> now, this is the largest development impact bond that has ever been uh, created. Um, so this is a financing instrument. Um, I refer to it as a traditional financing instrument because it uses traditional finance. But as an instrument, it's a fairly new uh, concept to use um, these bond mechanisms um, to uh, deliver results-based uh, capital. And um, so we have a multi-year um, grant uh, working with the UBS Optimus Foundation to research and develop these mechanisms um, specifically to look at how we can make this form of uh, programmable finance more scalable and uh, more efficient and more cost-effective. Um, and so in the picture here, you have uh, some photos that I took uh, during our field testing uh, in India, just outside of uh, Delhi uh, last August, um, where we conducted uh, the implementation of the uh, the, the uh, verification part of the application. And I'll explain this in more detail as we go through this. Um, and so um, the first phase of our work was really focused on you know, how do we record the state of the world in a way that um, can be verified and then provide um, stateful data on which to build applications such as the financing mechanisms. And so the field testing was really based on um, recording educational outcomes using standardized tests. And we implemented a technology in, um, innovation um, using uh, tablets for uh, the students to um, uh, do the, the standardized test. And then that fed into um, a process of verifying uh, those results and then feeding them into the finance mechanism. Um, so when we look at from a, a sort of bigger business requirements and system level requirements perspective, uh, really this is about you know how do we achieve scale and ensure that the capital that goes into development processes you know can effectively um, deliver the outcomes uh, through a whole set of processes that you know need to be in place and so this is not just about uh, directing capital it's also about kind of governing how the capital is formed how, uh, the decisions about um, how it should be spent and so on it's about how the capital gets collected uh, gets pooled um, and then the kind of purchasing that takes place with the capital um, both in terms of ensuring that service providers get paid but also dealing with disputes and resolutions around that um, then leading into the delivery and ultimately measurement of the outcomes where, with proofs about whether the capital has actually achieved its desired results or not. So this is the, the overall um, requirements for the system. 
the development impact bond mechanism, so this sort of traditional, uh, non-traditional mechanism, uh, is based on a concept of impact investors providing the working capital to enable projects to um, implement the interventions. And in this case, these are educational interventions such as uh, remedial um, uh, lessons um, for uh, children who are behind um, in their educational uh, capabilities. Um, and so this pays for the service provision, which then uh, leads to the uh, generation of data. And in the case of the uh, education bond, this data is in the form of independent um, standardized testing, um, which is done by an independent verifier um, who provides a validation um, of whether this has uh, led to the desired outcomes or not. And those outcomes are directed towards a target. If the targets are met, then there's an outcomes payer who would be the government or um, philanthropic institutions or various other um, uh, payers, depending on the context. Um, and those payers pay back the in investors, uh, usually with a, a coupon value. So they get kind of an interest um, repayment on the capital that has been deployed. Um, now, when we look at this uh, from, a, <clears throat> from an analysis of um, the challenges of implementing these instruments, um, based on the operations research that we did, um, we sort of came up with the conclusion that there's sort of three broad, broad categories of problems that these instruments face. The first is in coordination. So, you know, how do you ensure that um, the capital gets to where it's needed, um, that it uh, pays for the interventions that are required, that those interventions are given to the, the right beneficiaries, and um, that that whole kind of logic flow of um, inputs to outcomes actually happens. And particularly, how do you do this at scale where you've got um, a coordination requirement, you know, across multiple sites? Um, so think of, you know, the, you know, hundreds of thousands of schools across India. In, um, uh, the second category is around incentivization. So, you know, who takes the risks and who gets the rewards for um, applying capital in this way? And <clears throat> how do you link those incentives to provable outcomes? Um, and then the third um, problem space is around the actual financing. So how do you form the capital? How do you allocate the capital? And how do you ensure that the risks associated with the capital, the risks to investors, for instance, um, get uh, balanced against the uh, returns that are achieved. And so this is really where um, the concept of uh, alpha bonds, and in this case, the sort of flavor of this bond is a development impact bond, um, is an attempt to address uh, these systems levels um, uh, challenges. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to just kind of give a little bit of a back um, story to this, a little bit of history to this. So these ideas conceptually began around 2008, you know, when we had that sort of practice run at dealing with the global crisis. And um, we're based on a, a presentation that I gave in 2018 um, on how we could utilize the new technologies of Web 2.0 to potentially improve the delivery of development assistance or aid finance. And um, so this was kind of pre-blockchain and the idea was really around decentralization, about creating programmability, local coordination, incentivizing local um, actors and uh, stakeholders um, by giving a system of credits, which we called ECOs, and ensuring that um, those ECOs were, uh, were distributed in a way that rewarded people for making the right decisions. Um, so having uh, feedback loops that prove that if you back to a project that was successful in delivering its outcomes as measured with uh, good data, that that would increase your economic uh, power in the system and uh, incentivize kind of more of the same. Um, so uh, the idea was to have stakeholders actually being shareholders in these projects. Um, now, at the time, we didn't have the technologies available to create state-based uh, mechanisms to implement this kind of idea. Um, and so this concept sort of uh, had to stay a little kind of a, a, a dream until um, I discovered uh, the um, uh, Satoshi White Paper in 2013. And we then um, took these ideas and said, right, conceptually, if we had to implement a system that rewarded outcomes and there was some kind of conditional flow of capital, 
Um, what would that look like if we just abstracted away from the de development space? And so we, we came up with this kind of fictitious design um, with these very crude wireframes, um, which we called e -Supercro. So sort of on the idea of some kind of escrow mechanism that would be implemented with smart contracts. So kind of looking at Nick Zabo's paper at the time, so this was pre-Ethereum, but that you could use uh, the transactional capabilities of a blockchain, plug in some conditional logic and have an Oracle mechanism that says, you know, if this was done and somebody attests to that, um, that they could then sign on a multi-sig type of uh, contract and that would then release funds, for instance. And so this was a kind of, you know, like uh, pay, pay this um, entity if this is done uh, with the conditions such as time limits and so on. Um, now, this was kind of an interesting idea, but on its own, when we looked at this in the context of real world programs um, and, uh, and, uh, and needs in complex systems, um, it really was a simple mechanism that trying to address a complex um, uh, uh, system. Um, and so when we came to implement this in the first use case, which was around 2015, um, which was the Ampli project, uh, we built something that actually had, from the application user interface on the mobile app looked very similar to that um, escrow type of uh, um, um, application. So it was um, about awarding um, uh, subsidies that are paid by the South African government to early childhood development, sort of preschool service providers based on the children's attendance. And so our initial prototypes were, were really just about this kind of, if, if, the, if there's the, you know, then pay that. Um, but we very quickly came to realize that when we actually had to implement this in a real world context, um, that this didn't address important things like identification, for instance, you know, so um, the agents in the system delivering services to the beneficiaries would need to be identified, the beneficiaries would need to be identified, and um, that raised all kinds of questions around um, who gets to keep those registries and um, you know, who gets to be um, the issuer of those identities and so on. And so the Ampli project um, transitioned from being um, this very simple uh, transaction flow uh, based application into um, uh, a protocol driven um, uh, ap uh, application. And so we started to work in 2015 on some of these core protocols around identification, verification, and so on. Um, became part of the Rebuilding Web of Trust uh, community. Um, and uh, that community has produced the standards around digital identification, the, the DID standard, and uh, verifiable claims. Um, <clears throat> in 2017, we then decided to take this to the next level, which was um, focusing on this uh, um, kind of systems level uh, response uh, to building out not only protocols, but also the infrastructure to run those protocols, uh, which would then allow for applications to be built on top of that, which could then play into an economy. And that's really what I'm going to speak about today. So when I talk about protocols, um, the core protocols here uh, are protocols for identifying um, uh, impact or uh, a claim of impact, an attestation. So you have to identify the subject you need to identify who is making the claim um, and protocols around standardizing the data models so that we're able to um, resolve the, the information that is captured within a claim format um, and opinionate on that in order to uh, uh, have a verifiable claim. And so there's this uh, protocol around the data verification um, which creates a uh, unique uh, non-fungible digital asset backed by data um, with, an, uh, with an associated uh, proof, uh, cryptographic proof that enables us to then issue a token which is then an exchangeable um, um, uh, form of value that can generate liquidity. Um, so the infrastructure layer then uh, we, we uh, looked at kind of what would need to uh, be in place to run this protocol. We would need to have decentralized data storage. We would need to have data processing capabilities um, and an Oracle's marketplace. So this has been built out as the um, XO based blockchain. And then at the application level, sort of really two broad uh, categories of applications. Uh, so data applications, 
um, which are really about um, bringing more precision to the interventions that are being delivered. Um, so more prediction, personalization, um, prescription, and so on. Um, and then the other broad category really being the financing applications with a, um, with a, a sort of intent to decentralize develop, development finance using these applications. Um, since um, last year, we have been able to take um, the financing applications um, into a design process, um, which is the alpha bonds uh, concept, and um, have benefited from uh, a, uh, um, a grant uh, from the Interchain Foundation and um, also from working closely with uh, Block Science on the uh, crypto economic um, engineering of the system. And so with alpha bonds, um, we're uh, developing a programmable capital system, which is purposed towards um, achieving specific outcomes. And so this needs to bridge the gap between, um, or the two worlds between the cyber world and the physical world. So we've got the cyber world where we can put these kind of conditional transactional flow, uh, flows um, into blockchain mechanisms. Uh, but in the physical world, we have kind of real activities happening. We have agents interacting and we have um, outcomes being achieved or not being achieved. And so um, we need to have this um, connection between the two and, uh, and this is where the alpha bond mechanism comes in. Um, so this needs to run on a purpose state machine uh, basis so that um, the state of the world can be measured today and it can be compared against future states and the bond incentivizes the outcome or the progression towards desired future states. Um, each of those transitions require um, uh, uh, action to be taken, require uh, resources to be applied. And so there's conditional straight state transitions that happen in the process of moving from today to a future uh, state, stage of development. We felt it really important to address this issue of um, risk uh, externalization. Um, so most of the protocols that uh, currently um, are implemented externalize the risks and uh, are really quite simplistic. So we said, how do we measure risk and bring it into the protocol, um, into the mechanism so that uh, risk can be explicitly addressed within the system's design? And then finally, um, what is the Oracle mechanism that can uh, bring us this integral of alpha and enable a kind of synthesis of the information of what's going on in the real world in the physical world and bring it into the cyberspace. So the analogy here, which I think is, um, is quite useful, um, is a Tesla. Um, so the interface between our physical world and, and the um, cyber world or the mechanistic world um, is some kind of control mechanism where we have an ability to kind of interface the information that we have within our physical realm uh, with what's going on in a kind of uh, mechanical system um, or an automated system. Uh, we have a map, so we kind of know where we want to go. And the system needs to have some controls that provide feedback based on signals coming in. Um, and as we know, Tesla has done really well. It's uh, really kind of uh, um, uh, solving the problem of self-driving cars by synthesizing signals that come in from um, camera systems that enable uh, the car to drive with purpose towards specific destinations. So how do we bring that analogy into development finance? So with the Alpha Bond, um, we have some dashboard uh, um, uh, values that we can interface with and we can make decisions based on those. And we have um, some feedback loops that are bringing in information from the outside world. So the information that we have in our system is uh, based on uh, claims that are being made and verified. And so um, there is a velocity of claims coming in and there's a progress uh, kind of like your odometer, uh, you know, how far have you gone towards the end state that this this project is uh, meant to be achieving. Designing this system to operate um, with all of these different feedback loops and um, agent behaviors and so on um, has really benefited from um, 
doing the research and analysis together with block science um, that brings this into a crypto economic design um, a kind of paradigm. And so um, as Shruti mentioned earlier, we started off with quite a complex map of the requirements, you know, so what if all, who are all the actors, what are the different flows of value and information in a system? Um, and uh, this diagram is really just to uh, express, you know, the kind of complex interactions um, in the most simplified form of representation for this uh, system um, for an, an impact bond. And so when we take um, all of this complexity and we say, all right, this exists within a space which needs to be directed and needs to have some bounds on it, um, the, uh, the concept of a configuration space becomes really interesting because it allows us to conceptualize um, those bounds and uh, that kind of direction of travel that can be enabled. Um, and within this configuration, configuration space, um, the interface between what's going on in the physical world and what is going on in the cyber world is a bonding curve. So um, in, in, our, um, in our mechanism, we have um, an attest attestation mechanism, which is the controller uh, bringing in information um, from the outside world and doing that in a very uh, structured way that creates stateful records on which um, these these economic mechanisms can operate. Um, so this is um, very kind of early uh, modeling that uh, we did um, on CAD-CAD. Uh, it will be replaced by um, additional work that is happening in the next phase of research. Um, but essentially here, we started with the assumption that the underlying projects um, that are being funded by impact bonds um, have some kind of natural growth dynamic. And uh, most of natural systems uh, tend to have this kind of sigmoidal uh, logistic uh, um, shape growth and uh, would generally be validated by asking um, uh, someone who's implementing a project, you know, to give an indication of how they think the project generally would go. And if they wave their hands around, they probably kind of give this kind of shape um, and say, well, you know, kind of starts off slow and then we ramp up and we we get a lot more done. And then towards the end, it becomes more difficult to achieve the last few um, uh, uh, activities in the project to really kind of uh, complete the delivery. Um, and these curves are going to have you know different shapes depending on the context, depending on the type of project, depending on the duration. Um, but there'll be some kind of uh, it's um, patterning and possibly some categories of curves uh, that um, are representational of different types of projects. And so we're starting our assumption that um, these patterns exist and that they provide some kind of reference against which we can measure what is expected versus what is actually achieved. Um, but of course, these systems uh, never happen uh, as we expect them, and uh, mainly because of uh, people, but also other kinds of dynamics. Um, and so we need to integrate into any kind of model and in, into any expectations for the system, um, you know, the dynamics of different agent behaviors and um, estimations of kind of what the system would do uh, given different sets of agent behaviors. And so when we just kind of play this out in a little bit more kind of um, uh, in a nuanced way, we can say, well, the project might not actually go so well. It might have more of a kind of wavy curve. Um, you know, it was doing really well and then something happened. Um, and we can superimpose this on um, what we expect to be uh, the reference for a project and um, adjust our expectations based on this. And so when we bring this information together, we're able to synthesize um, a trajectory, a sort of vector of travel towards a future end state. So if the project is not doing so well today, the likelihood of achieving a, a completed um, uh, uh, end state and the expected outcomes um, is less. Um, now, when we're able to do this in an iterative real-time feedback loop way that gives us information um, about the project, but also uh, the it influences the pricing um, of the investment instrument and price, as Hayek says, said um, 
integrates a lot of information that is not necessarily explicit. And so um, when you have a pricing signal and you also have a performance signal coming from the project and you're able to integrate these, uh, that provides a very powerful set of feedback loop um, kind of uh, instrument panel uh, uh, parameters that enable us to um, achieve uh, much greater precision and performance out of um, the implementation of these kinds of projects with a move towards potentially um, having self-driving mechanisms. Um, so kind of you know, Tesla impact bonds um, that are decentralized are taking in signals from their local context and following some kind of map, um, but responding to the conditions uh, that, that they find. So implementing this um, complexity, uh, as Shruti uh, presented earlier, um, is really then about defining you know, uh, a, a set of finite states through which the machinery can go and the transition conditions uh, for moving from one state to another. Um, and this is essentially what gives us the distributed control and optimization potential. So in the context of the development impact bond, the education bond, that bond is for 200,000 school children over a four year period, um, over three states in India with hundreds of schools involved. Uh, in a way, it's too big to fail um, and uh, is not very adaptive. And so our vision of you know, how to move this into the next generation of impact bonds is to decentralize, unitize, and you know, rather have 200 bonds each with a thousand school children, which are locally adaptive, which enable um, much more variety in terms of agent, uh, agents who participate, who gets to fund it, who gets to deliver it, um, and how it gets verified, and therefore enable scale through, um, through decentralization. So, um, so the way that these state transitions are represented in terms of the user interface um, is through an eventing system which notifies the user when those state transitions are going to happen. So one of the um, most important state transitions is where there's a dispute in the system. So enabling um, a, a dispute claim to be submitted, um, which can then shift the, the uh, bond from an active state into a paused state until the dispute is, is resolved, for instance. So just kind of giving a sense of what this looks like from the um, user interface perspective. Um, so now kind of moving from the original conception of you know, conditional payments really being about um, managing almost kind of an escrow flow of transactions to you know, how this fits within a, a complex systems um, uh, paradigm as programmable capital, uh, the purpose of um, the mechanisms that we're uh, working on is um, really, um, I believe, uh, towards these three big categories. So the first thing is to ensure that the capital that um, is deployed for sustainable development and for these important initiatives um, that are for the, for the public good, that they really serve the commons. So these mechanisms need to be designed so that they can achieve the credible commitments such as the, the, the SDGs, the global goals, um, they need to enable self-organization that scales locally, and this needs to be collectively monitored with accountability mechanisms. And so we can achieve this by having inbuilt incentivization mechanisms that rewards um, the participants for achieving desirable states and uh, progressing towards that, um, but being done within communities that are bounded with rights and are governed by rules that can incur penalties. Otherwise, the attack vectors on, on these uh, kind of decentralized financing mechanisms would, uh, would, would, would make them fail. Um, and then um, the second broad category of what programmable capital needs to achieve is to build new economies. So designed, designed to um, bring resilience into these economies, so absorbing the risks, um, which is where the um, risk adjustment mechanisms um, are really important, enabling inclusion, so uh, how these tokenized mechanisms and the issuance of, um, of purpose tokens um, 
um, can then enable the distribution of resources um, amongst the participants, whether that's the implementers, the investors, um, or the, the beneficiaries. And these systems should allow for sustainable growth, but within the defined limits that we know are sustainable. Um, and so we need to ensure that these systems are de-risked uh, by internalizing the externalities. And this is really where the uh, crypto economic engineering work is really um, key to understanding how these systems can operate and under what parameters um, by bringing information in that will enable the system to continue and not to get stuck or to um, or to uh, or to fail. Um, uh, when we have these mechanisms, it's not really only about um, making traditional finance more efficient and um, uh, and uh, improving the uh, cost benefit and so on, but really about creating um, whole new economies. So there's a really a kind of fundamental shift uh, that could be enabled by programmable capital mechanisms um, by um, really utilizing the data and the uh, the assets that are generated through the data that runs through these systems um, to scale up and to become smarter and to become more precise um, about how impacts get delivered and therefore um, increasing the distribution of benefits. Um, uh, and then um, the, the third uh, important um, thing that these things need to, uh, uh, these systems need to achieve is to have effective feedback systems that are designed for humans in the loop, um, but also uh, for economies that are going to be sustainable and, um, and considering the kind of environmental impacts as well. Um, so enabling systems that are networked and distributed, adaptive and predictive, and that have intelligence built into them. Um, so um, kind of looking at what we've achieved in terms of the design, um, going to uh, the kind of definition of um, what uh, perspectives need to be taken into consideration within these crypto economic systems. Um, we've, uh, we've got a system that is driven by sort of macro level uh, goals, um, such as performance metrics around the outcomes um, that set specific targets around um, verifiable uh, claims and um, the incentives around achieving those claims. Uh, and that um, on the foundational level, um, have got protocols that are built in in terms of how information gets formed, how it gets um, solidified in a stateful kind of way, and then how we act on that information uh, using um, uh, formally specified and um, explicitly designed uh, mechanisms. Um, so I'd like to just say um, a little bit about the the alpha. So alpha is, is an integral of uh, any kind of information that can come in from the uh, physical world and can be fed in um, as a uh, as a as an, uh, coefficient um, that can come into the algorithm um, that is um, doing the pricing and issuance um, of tokens. And uh, Shruti spoke a, um, a bit about um, this prediction being made by the agents in the system. Um, there are many different sources of uh, that information. And really, ultimately, once we have an, enough data flowing through the system, um, we should really be able to make this an intelligent system that's able to integrate information from multiple sources into um, this integral of a risk coefficient, which will uh, essentially inform the system of the likelihood of an outcome being achieved. Um, so uh, probability distribution, you know, zero to one, um, which then feeds back in and adjusts the, the curve and has uh, an effect on the, the price um, of participation in the bond. Um, once we have multiple projects running or multiple bonds running, um, the data across these different projects and the bonds um, associated with the projects will allow for much greater calibration um, both in terms of setting the uh, reference curves um, that give us our, our kind of prior um, expectations, um, but then also in terms of uh, the um, calibration of the of the alpha value, so that we become um, a lot more uh, pre um, sort of accurate in the predictions um, and utilize machine learning to make that happen. 
So finally, I just want to um, kind of put it out there. You know, we've spoken today about a use case around education and a specific flavor of implementation of this results-based financing or programmable capital. Um, but really, this uh, opens up, I think, a whole uh, space to think about the kinds of economic games that we can play with programmable capital. Um, so beyond development impact bonds, you know, how, how can we utilize um, programmable capital to bring greater precision to specific projects or um, to improve the outcomes of social impact incentive schemes or sustainable finance and social finance mechanisms, whether that's uh, subsidies or um, universal basic income or you know, any of the different flavors of um, finance that is meant to be um, for the good of um, humanity. Um, and this can have applications in insurance and many, many more potential um, uh, use cases um, where uh, what we're trying to achieve is measuring the state of the world today, um, enabling reliable, trustworthy measurement of that state over time, and then incentivizing the achievement of, um, of future states or even penalization of not achieving future, a future state and building that into these kind of self-driving mechanisms. So I, I think that's the kind of um, vision of where we go to with this. And uh, on that note, I think I want to leave enough time for a good number of questions. Um, perfect, Sean. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, it's really nice to hear um, um, how extensive your work is and what what on, yeah you're working on so many things and it's really and that you're doing the research in these fields as well so um yeah it was really refreshing um do we have any questions at the moment does anyone want to ra raise a hand and ask a question directly here i'm checking in on in the chat and i don't see any questions that have been posted but if anyone would like to raise a hand yes shebnam is raising a hand shebnam please do unmute yourself and ask a question hey hey sean hi I don't know if you can hear me already. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry, I came in a bit late, but uh, did you talk about the, the use of bonding curves at all? Because I wanted to get an update as well. Yes. Uh, the, the, so the, um, the whole design is based on bonding curves, but not static bonding curves um, that are uh, defined ex ante. Um, but rather a dynamic process that feeds in information via an alpha coefficient to adjust the bonding curve uh, dynamically on an ongoing basis. Very cool. But you didn't share uh, uh, info yet on that. In this, did you share in the beginning? Okay. Super cool. No, it was great to see the models and everything. It really is coming together. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you, Shebnam. So, so I think I think just one of the discussions that happened in um, in between the talks was around you know the extent to which these um, mechanisms are kind of really theoretical and untested, and um, the potential maybe the potential dangers of assuming that these will work in the real world. Um, so I think I'd like to kind of reflect that most of what we do, particularly within the, de the development space, so the um, you know, sustainable development, um, traditional development sector, uh, tends to be really naive. Um, in, in other words, um, not very well informed by prior experiences um, and not really using a lot of data and information um, to make decisions and to improve the precision and the performance of what happens. And, and I say that as somebody who's very experienced you know, in this um, sector. And so I, I really see this as being kind of a, um, uh, a considering like what are the alternatives? So if, if the alternative is to run these programs blind, you know, to send uh, large sums of capital into um, 
kind of emergency or longer term development processes, but really do that quite blind and 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 um, and without these feedback loops and without the rigor of the kind of understanding of the economic consequences. Um, I think that whatever we can do that is better than that is worth trying out. Um, and so uh, parts of these mechanisms, uh, like the um, attestation uh, mechanism, um, you know, is kind of tried it, it's been tried out and tested. Other parts of it are more ex experimental, um, you know, such as the kind of continuous um, funding part and the um, algorithmic pricing of that funding. Uh, but um, we have opportunities now to implement these things in real world contexts. Um, our next step with the um, education impact bond is uh, to run a live pilot. It's just been also a little bit put on hold. Um, it's um, a pilot in India um, around uh, Mumbai working with uh, a technology um, provider within India um, where they have tablet based learning programs um, and really kind of uh, closely coupling the data collection on a real time basis so that the children are um, playing educational games um, and within those games there's uh, real time feedback in, in terms of the levels that they achieve in those games. So we're able to get uh, a lot of very rich signals um, from the system and feed that into, um, into, into our uh, mechanisms. Um, and so that's what we're going to be testing out in, in coming months into the models right yeah uh, what also was new or um or it hit me now really is that you said typically these are mammoth projects really huge projects where it also becomes very opaque uh, and after five years you see whether there's results or not and if it didn't go then everything is just covered up or you know we will, we will move on to the next one or something but um the way you put it that basically also the project and project outcome that bond can be um well have their own different uh um yeah i, I don't know sub bonds or how do you call it but basically have that model and the data that you get into the model and the whole risk adjustment uh, and the signaling of it uh, basically the diversification or the ability to um intervene with some projects who don't do well or get data from others who do in the vicinity, et cetera. Uh, it opens up a lot more, including that it all is basically getting back into the model of the impact bond. Yes, yeah, so um, in 2013, when, <clears throat> when I came across um, Bitcoin, um, my initial Eureka reaction was, you know, now we can bring performance accounting and financial accounting into the same ledger. And the sort of naive um, idea was that <clears throat> you could you could um, just integrate uh, the kind of the claim into the transaction, you know, in the memo field of a Bitcoin transaction. And um, and then you would have, um, you know, a flow of information and value at the same time. Um, that um, was kind of backed up with uh, some of the research that <clears throat> has come out of the Media Lab um, uh, at MIT. Um, Sandy Pentland um, has this idea of social physics where um, if you want to bring about um, uh, kind of systemic um, behavior change, then you need to flow information and value at the same time. You know, so if I um, if I give you a suggestion that you should stop smoking, then that has much less influence on your behavior than if I provide an incentive together with that suggestion and information about why you should stop smoking. Um, if I incentivize your, your partner to say, if the partner gets you to, your partner gets you to stop smoking, then that even has a higher sort of um, results. Uh, and so, the idea was that you could kind of bring together these information and capital value flows into the same um, process by putting them on the same ledger. Um, uh, that's a kind of simplistic view, but it's a huge um, advance over how things currently happen or have happened in the past, um, which is that financing 
um, supply chains, so supplying capital into development projects are completely divorced from, um, from the uh, information supply chain. So bringing information back up the system and correlating the two. And generally the um, evaluation mechanisms are post hoc and then by then the team has already moved on and uh, the lessons are very rarely integrated into, into the next um, programs. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the chat. Um, it says, I would like to know how the project progressed over the last year, that is partners gathered, how many people are working on it and so on. Um, yes, yeah, so but are you specifically asking about ICSO or about the impact bond project? I, I guess let me speak about both. So, um, so at the impact bond level, um, we, we're working closely with UBS Optimus Foundation and um, the whole concept of impact bonds is still relatively new. So there's a, an impact bond working group, um, which is um, representing an international group of all the sort of um, influencers and policymakers and so on from um, the development financing institutions and um, private investors and so on. Um, so that meets um, every year and we're feeding back into that process. So also uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, in a way, um, you know, our stakeholder um, a community is quite well defined in terms of who this is directed to, towards and um, um, a set of developments around that in terms of building out the evidence base um, and also getting more um, uh, implementations of these kinds of, uh, of projects. Um, in, in terms of progress on the impact bonds, um, we've been um, I think really uh, fortunate to get um, the financial support of the Interchain Foundation to fund this research work with Block Science. Um, we um, have the uh, multi-year grant from uh, UBS, which is um, allowing us to do the implementations, but also in the context of you know a, a an institutional um, uh, setup which would enable this to be. Um, systematized and and sort of really taken to market um, once we have the evidence of it of it working and so um, we've really come a long way I think in terms of um, getting on board um, some key people within the banking sector to to really see this as interesting and um, and to support it um, in terms of the EXO project more broadly um, we have built um, the infrastructure of uh, EXO um, on um, Cosmos uh, based uh, uh, blockchain and um, that has been um, a really positive um, uh, decision in, in, in retrospect um, given all of the developments um, within Cosmos over the past year um, and now the move towards um, the internet of blockchains with the inter-blockchain communication protocol and so um, the potential now is um, for this to really uh, start to provide an infrastructure for an, an internet of impact so kind of really um, that very um, aspirational idea of being able to um, provide some infrastructure components that are protocol driven um, and that could really be implemented by anyone within um, different types of networks that have different governance and different um, sort of hosting arrangements, different different economies um, is it, really becoming uh, a reality. Um, and so we're kind of on that um, brink of uh, of now moving into a multi-blockchain uh, implementation of um, EXO protocol uh, blockchains. Um, and we're working with partners um, in uh, various parts of the world doing that. So we've got developers in, in Europe and India and South Africa and, um, and then a lot of uh, um, uh, partners who <clears throat> are, um, uh, are implementing specific use cases. Okay, great. Um, we stu still do have a couple of minutes left. Uh, would anyone else like to re raise a hand or uh, pose a question? If not, or while you're thinking about the next question, I would uh, also maybe like to um, ask you from the presentation, I see you're, you're covering a lot of uh, different topics and you're truly working interdisciplinary with, with uh, many partners and collaborations. And for example, the block science is of course providing um, amazing content and amazing um, uh, stepping stones, so to say, for, for a 
particular thing that you need for your project. But what would be the thing that you're still lacking for the active projects that you have uh, or any future projects uh, coming up? What is that that you're still lacking? Like, for example, you said identity was back in 2014 is what you realized is not hasn't been developed yet. Uh, what what kind of difficulties are you experiencing at the moment? <clears throat> so um, I would say that our biggest challenge in the next phase, you know, taking this into real world implementations is going to be um, regulatory and legal. Um, so to Sherman's earlier point. Um, so um, there's, there's, I think, a huge opportunity space around um, uh, maybe some regulatory, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, so there's, regulators are creating a space to, Im to improve um, the conditions for development finance. Um, so whether that's for climate finance or SDG finance and particularly European um, uh, regulators. Um, and so the, the policy frameworks around this, whether it's around, uh, you know, issuing green bonds or, um, you know, there's a lot of policy work that's been done um, is in place. But now we have the really difficult um, uh, challenge of, of actually uh, turning policy into practice um, and challenging a lot of the paradigms, you know. So, for instance, you know, if we move towards a um, an ideal situation where impact bonds can be issued by people without kind of institutional backing um, or by you know small organizations. So if an NGO wants to issue its own bond, um, under the current regulations, they would need to um, issue a prospectus and get regulatory approval for that. Um, now that is completely uh, you know the opposite of what what we're kind of building in terms of um, size and scale and automation. And so, um, you know, I think that there's going to be a huge need for us to challenge some of these processes around, um, you know, how regulations get applied. Um, but I think that the opportunity is, is very great, given the urgency of um, large scale um, funding and the risks that are associated with, with that. Um, so if we're able to show that we reduce risks because we internalize the risks and we also have um, uh, provable mechanisms that are uh, safe fail, um, you know, uh, that have got um, bounded um, ways of operating uh, that don't incur risks uh, that are, are not, um, that can be systemic, um, then I think that we, we, can, we can achieve this. But we need lots of support in this area. Yeah, as we saw in the in the flow charts in the previous presentations, the legal aspect is the one that you do at the end because otherwise you're you're not going to be able to do anything if you first start thinking about the legal uh, um, aspects of, of the project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if, if you still have time, Sean, so the, the live stream on YouTube um, um, is stopped now, but we can continue the discussion here for another couple of minutes. And we have a last question um, in the chat um, that says, who is running the blockchain service to run the contracts? Um, so we have an, a network of relayers. Um, so um, it's a proof of stake blockchain, the primary blockchain. So um, anyone can set up uh, a, uh, a network and it can be proof of authority or um, you know, any kind of configuration of uh, how you would want to run that using Tendermint as the, um, as the consensus mechanism. Um, for the primary chain, um, which is the sustainability hub, um, we have independent validators who operate as um, relayers. So by relayer, uh, we mean that they have a market function. Um, so they are channels to the market in terms of originating projects and connecting those projects to the services that are delivered um, through the network. Um, so we're um, in the process of rolling those uh, relayer uh, nodes out um, with, um, with a very explicit um, objective to make those relayers representative of kind of geographically and also in terms of kind of sectorally um, where the need is, you know. So if we look at the distribution of, of most of the blockchain infrastructure, it tends to be um, very skewed. 
Um, and uh, so in terms of kind of incentivizing the setup of nodes, uh, we're wanting to ensure that that happens um, in, in countries and regions where uh, these, these projects are really based. Um, and so we have a relay node uh, coming online in, in India, uh, one in South Africa, um, and then um, uh, Hong Kong, um, and so on. So we're trying to get a, a, a geographic distribution, but um, but also um, ensure that uh, the right kind of uh, organizations are involved. All right, amazing. I think another point, because um, I, I was really interested um, uh, um, listening to Vinay's um, uh, presentation this morning, um, sort of speaking about the importance of having incorruptible or um, you know, uh, fraud resistant um, blockchain infrastructure. So one of the things we've really focused on is uh, ensuring the um, integrity of, of the blockchain. So this kind of goes counter to a lot of the libertarian kind of ideals around you know an anonymity and permissionless and all of that. But we've built in the identifier um, uh, mechanisms, um, so decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials um, at the very core of um, the operating system for, for this blockchain. So in order to transact on an EXO protocol network, you need to have a decentralized identifier and you need to present credentials with that. And um, so we're hoping that this will kind of bring the level of, um, of kind of integrity uh, as well as the regulatory acceptability of um, these networks uh, to a point that enables us to scale and operate right now, rather than in, at some sort of aspirational future point where, um, where there's a different uh, kind of uh, governance system.